to introduce our speaker for today, who is Professor Kate Sears. And Kate trained as a nurse at Charing Cross Hospital in London, uh, in the last century, I guess. <laughs> yes, same as I was. Um, she gained an interest in research while working in intensive care and considered um, pain experiences of patients. Uh, Kate undertook research into pain, anxiety and recovery and has been researching pain, man pain management for over 30 years, so clearly a very knowledgeable lady. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Uh, she is a member of the NIHR Service and Delivery Research Board and is chair of the Scientific Programme Committee of the British Pain Society. Kate's main role is um, she's Professor of Health Research and Director of the RCN Research Institute, uh, which is hosted um, by Warwick Medical School at the University of Warwick. Uh, so I'm sure you'd like to join me in giving Kate a very warm welcome. Thank you very much, Liz. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm really delighted to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. The RCN is also 100 years old this year, so it's great to see all these celebrations about nursing all over the place. And so wishing you the very best in this special anniversary year. And I hope those of you that took part in the fun run, either here or in Oxford, have recovered sufficiently and aren't aching too much after that. Um, I, I feel I've got a bit of a link to Oxford Brooks as well because I worked at the Radcliffe Infirmary from 1993 to 2006 at what was then the National Institute for Nursing and we shared um, offices with the Oxford Brooks lecturer practitioners so we got to know staff quite well so I feel, I feel very much at home. Now I've put this quote up because this is um, your Dean in your booklet that Liz was just talking about. This is what she said. Developing clinical academic roles that push the boundaries of nursing care through research and innovation. And she said that was something that you were really aspiring to here. Um, and so I thought, hmm, that's, that's really interesting. Let's, let's look at that in a little bit more detail. So clinical academic researchers, is that what we want? Why should we bother with research? Now obviously I've got a vested interest in this. You can see I'm the director of a research unit, so I'm probably not going to say, don't bother, or maybe I will, but just joking, no. I'm not going to say that, am I, because you know, this has been a big bit of what I've been doing. But what I'd like to do today is show why I've bothered with research and why it matters, and how important it is to, be giving the, to underpin giving the best possible care that you can. Now, in preparation for this talk, I was talking to um, two of the PhD students that I supervise about why bother with research. And we were talking about what I might say. One of them advised me, she knows me quite well, she said, don't go on about the ins and outs of research, as if I would, but, you know. So they're always very direct PhD students, they keep your feet firmly on the ground. She said, give some success stories. And the other wanted to make the point that she was very used to using evidence in practice, but she really wanted to contribute to the evidence base rather than just use it. And she felt that it was amazing that nurses can do research and, as well as other professionals because nurses spend so much time in clinical practice and have access to so much information that it can really lead to a lot of research ideas and questions. And I'll come back to their stories in a minute. So if we're going to think about why should we bother with research, it's probably worth just briefly thinking about what is research. Sometimes research has got this air of being something that's a bit different, a bit tricky, a bit outside our comfort zone. But at the very heart of it, it's about asking questions so that we can understand things better. And we already know how to do this. I was on the bus the other day going into London, and this kid was asking his dad a lot of questions. Everything was why, why, why. The kid was as bright as anything, and the dad was trying to answer, and we were, all the passengers were smiling at the dad and nodding, and he was quite enjoying it. But it went on and on and on. And in the end, you won't be surprised to know that he said at the end, because it is, when he was asked why. And the kid responded, why is it? Because it is. And I thought, yeah, there's a really good researcher there. He knows how to ask questions and keep going. So, you know, we find out about the world by asking questions. And this is a great start for research. Um, so, you know, what you're doing in research is you're asking questions and then you're systematically collecting data to try and answer those questions to improve your understanding. I think when you're busy in practice and you want to fit in, some environments do enable you to ask questions, but others it can be much more difficult. Um, 
But often you have got questions in clinical practice, you know, what would be the best way to do this? What's this been like for patients? Those sorts of questions that are really important to improving your care. So what research does, it enables you to provide the best possible care. It's a bit of a non-brainer, this really, isn't it? Because, of course, we want to provide the best care that we can. High-quality research benefits patients, so it's not an optional extra. For me, it's very much an essential component. And making sure that our care is evidence-based is a key part of nursing for me. Now, we talked earlier about um, asking questions, but even before that, there's something more important, and that's what all of us can do. It's easy to recognize a clinical problem. If you're at work and trying to give the best care you can, every so often there'll be something and you think, you know, this is a real issue, I need to know more about this so to, to influence my practice. So what sort of research do we really need for nursing? Well, there's lots of different types of research and obviously as I've been advised not to go into the ins and outs of research too much, I'm going to take quite a broad brush approach. But basically, it's going to be stuff that describes what it's like, so often qualitative research when your question is, you know, what's it been like for patients to have, for example, chronic pain? What's it been like to have this procedure? Or it might be something that explains, you know, what's the most effective way to get people with pain to sleep or what's the, what's the best drug in this situation? And in those sorts of situations, you might be looking at something like a randomised control trial. Now, randomised control trials have got a bit of a bad press in nursing sometimes because people see, talk about them as the gold standard. Now, they are the gold standard when you're looking at questions of effectiveness. But when you're trying to describe something, then qualitative research is much more appropriate, and that, that would be the gold standard then. There's two aspects, I think. There's using research and there's doing research. And not everyone will want to or be suited to actually doing it. But using it, something we all want to do. Um, research awareness is around making sure that your care is based on the best possible research. Um, and I think when you think about doing research, what you're trying to do there is you're, you're developing an important first skill that you had when you were a child and asking these questions so we can better understand. Sure, there are very specific ways of doing things in research, and there's quite a lot to learn, but there's plenty of people out there that can help you do that. I, mean, I, think, I think, you know, before very long, if you want to be in a specialist nurse role, then you're going to need to have a master's um, degree. You'll have chance to do research then, and you'll have proper training and support from experienced supervisors. And some people then are often inspired to go on and do a master's degree. Some might say, never again. I quite often talk to nurses that have finished doing a master's degree and say, no, that's it, that's the end of studying. And then perhaps, and for some of them it will be, they've had enough, but others sort of six months later there might be this little email that said, can we just talk about this and we have a little discussion. And, you know, the research bug often really bites and people really want to keep going with it. So what about doing a PhD? Some of you are already doing one and you'll know it's a big undertaking and a lot of studying and quite a lot of sacrifices. But boy, do you learn a lot. You learn how to do research, and you get a chance to really make a difference to care because of your research. And it's the perfect grounding to go on. People often think PhD's the last thing that you do. That's, that's the sort of pinnacle. But actually, in a research career, it's really the sort of basic. A master's and a, and a PhD are the basics for going on then and doing more research. And I just wanted to tell you a bit about three PhD studies who either have already finished or will be finishing soon, who are going to make a real contribution to knowledge. First of all, someone that, I don't think she's in the room, Dr. Louise State, who um, is a senior lecturer here, she did a PhD and I was lucky enough to supervise her with Liz Tutton. And her, the title of her PhD, which was absolutely fantastic, is I've never been surrounded by so many people and felt so alone. She was looking at people's experiences of technology in intensive care. She did a fantastic PhD. Um, I think she could be really proud of it because it's made a real difference. But not only did she do a PhD, but she's gone on to get an award from the National Institute for Health Research and the British Association of Critical Care Nursing to take that forward and develop some of the ideas in that to really make a difference to practice. The PhD students I was talking to you before that about their both success stories. So I'll just tell you a little bit more so you get a flavour of what they're doing. 
One's a staff nurse on care of older people ward. She's working with older people as she does her PhD. And she's looking at assessment of care in older people. She's collecting all her data. She's just about finished that. And she's just starting on the analysis, which is always a bit of a scary phase because you've got all this stuff and what are you going to do with it? But it's also quite exciting. And she's totally passionate about improving care for older people. And she's a really great ambassador. She's self-funding, and so she's working a bit, and she's doing the, the PhD, and she's applied for lots of different fellowships and funding streams, and they're all small amounts of money, but together they add up. And lots of external organisations have been really impressed, and they've given her this funding, and she's kept going. The other one is a mental health nurse. She's still working and doing her PhD as well, and she's looking at self-compassion in nursing. We all know about compassionate care and how important it is, and the Francis report suggested that what, what can go wrong if you haven't got compassionate care. But how good are we at looking after ourselves? And that's what she's looking at. It's really interesting. Do we even know how to do that? Some of us, I think, don't know how to look after ourselves. And I was fascinated when I was reading your 125-year booklet, one of the mottos, or a sort of motto or ethos of the Radcliffe Infirmary was patient first, self last. And I thought well, that's really interesting because maybe that's, that sort of whole culture is something that's drifted forward and, and maybe it's difficult for us to look after ourselves, but it's really important to look after yourself and show yourself some self-compassion if you're going to be able to deliver compassionate care. And so I just wanted to give you a sort of little bite-sized bits of those, of those bits of work, so you can see how doing a PhD can really make a difference and have an impact. And all of these people have identified the issue from their clinical practice and have gone on to look at how we understand that better. So as it's 125 years, cent centenary and a quarter, looking at where we've got to and how we've got there seemed to make sense. You can see the World Health Organization in 1966 were talk, was talking about research was important into the improvement of nursing care and that it should be promoted as an essential part of planning the health services. So it's nothing really new. And in 1975, they were talking about nursing research sometimes being seen as something that was rather unrelated to the real world of nursing. And occasionally I do get, when I'm talking to people, they do see it as something that's a bit separate and not integral. And what I'm trying to argue today is that it's absolutely integral. Now, it's been around for quite a while. Even before this um, report, Florence Nightingale led the way in the 1850s. Now, I'm not going to talk too much about her because I think Lynn MacDonald gave the last lecture covering a lot, of, a lot of this, so I won't go into detail. But she was interested in the high mortality in the Crimean War, and she used statistics, got them all together, collected new material when it was needed. She developed surveys, and she presented stuff in really accessible ways. And very importantly for her, she made science accessible, especially to polit politicians and civil servants. And so, for example, she used graphical displays of mortality, and she showed that soldiers were dying from disease rather than their wounds at a ratio of seven to one. And on the back of that, she got money to do things differently. So she knew how to use her research and have impact. I think she had friends in high places, which, which helped. But she was doing evidence-based nursing in the 1850s. So my, my main source of information, obviously, Lady Bird Books. <laughs> Now, although she was really keen on data that she collected herself, she was also very keen on obedience in nursing, which I always think probably didn't provide the ideal environment for the nurses to start questioning and asking how things were done. But times have changed, and the role of the nurse has changed as well. Here are two more Ladybird books. One's, the one on the left is from 1963, and I rather like the little face in the word book. I think that's quite nice. Um, and the other one is from 1983, which is actually after I qualified. So it's quite interesting to look at that because some of it feels very familiar. In the 1963 book, the doctors tell the nurses what to do. Nurses carry out the doctor's orders. So very much not a questioning approach, just do what you're told. So that links into the obedience strand from Florence Nightingale. Um, in 1983, it's still perhaps quite difficult to question. I remember, for example, on, on one ward where we used mercurochrome, which was bright red antibacterial thing, mercury-based, you know, perhaps not such a good idea, and on some patients. And then another consultant, we had to use egg white and oxygen to dry the egg white on pressure sores. So on the same ward, you're doing two different things. 
and I tried to find out what the evidence base was. I can tell you it got slapped down pretty quickly. <laughs> so asking why can be difficult. You want to fit in, and sometimes people don't see questioning in a positive light. However, by the 1970s, we were getting a lot more research that was very relevant to nursing. Um, the study of nursing care was a, a seminal bit of um, research in nursing, really, and there are reports from 14 different um, research studies about nursing from 1970 to 1975. Well, here's one of them. It's uh, Information and Prescription Against Pain. Jack Haywood um, wrote that one. You can see on there it was £1.30, so quite a bargain. But I'm pleased to tell you it's even more of a bargain now because all of these are, have been um, PDF'd onto the RCN's website. So if you want to have a look at any of these, they're quite interesting historical documents. There's one called The Proper Study of the Nurse, another one by Felicity Stockwell called The Unpopular Patient. And this book, the reason why I've picked out this one is that reading that made me think about pain much more. And, and a few years later, I went on um, to, do a, to do a PhD. And Jack Haywood was in the, in the department, actually, and was a great source of, of support. So if you want to look at those, if you type in study of nursing care and RCN, they'll come up on, the, on Google or any other reputable database. Um, and and this, study, this study of nursing care series was funded by what was then called the Department of Health and Social Security. So the government was putting money into nursing research e even then. So what about now? I mean, I think it is really, really positive now. There's so much good research out there relevant to nursing. Nurses are on research funding panels. They're successful getting research grants, leading studies being on teams. And research is at the heart of many trust um, documents now. In the United States, for example, there's been a National Institute of Nursing Research for over 30 years. In the UK, it's mainly the National Institute for Health Research that's, that's funding nursing, but it, um, organizations like the Economic and Social Research Council and the Medical Research Council do fund some nursing or, or joint um, studies. So nurses are successful and they're becoming research leaders and able to support other people as they develop their skills. Some of you will know about clinical research networks where you can get involved. And I know here in, o in Oxford and Swindon, you've got academic health science networks and academic health science centers. And also there are GP practices that are undergoing research ready training. So they're ready to take research. So there's loads and loads of potential. So using research and doing research, how do you get into research? I just thought I'd tell you a little bit about my story. As Liz said, I trained as a nurse at Charing Cross Hospital uh, um, in London, and we were the first um, cohort of a nursing degree that was doing, the, doing our degree and doing our clinical at Charing Cross Hospital, and it was the second year of the, of the degree. We were split, half did it at Charing Cross and half did it at St George's in, in well, actually in London at that time, but then it moved to Tooting. Um, and I just want to tell you about my, my first, first day, really, because we actually ended up taking quite a lot of stick. So I was 18, lived in Devon all my life, pretty naive, came up to this massive great teaching hospital, and the first day on the ward, I walked in, and I was, I think, terrified would be an understatement, actually. And the, and the sister said, um, oh, here comes a degree nurse, let's see if she's got a flashing light on her head. You sort of die and try and blend into the background. We, d we used to get some support. There, there was a s system then called 2 plus 1 where, where you were doing state registered nurse where you took your exams at the end of the second year but then you stayed in student nurse uniform for another year to finish the experience bit because that group of people were quite different. No one liked them so they were quite nice to us. So we, we sort of had, had alliances. Um, and then I worked as a staff nurse when I qualified on a general surgical ward. Then I went up to intensive care, worked up there for a while and did the intensive care course. And it was really on surgery and intensive care that I was really getting worried about pain relief and pain management and wondering, you know, how, how could we really get it right? And I saw an advert in the nursing press for what was then the Department of Health and Social Security to do a research study. Um, and really, with what now would be seen as startlingly little development, um, I, I managed to get an interview and blag my way through it and get funding. When I look at what I, what I actually had developed by then, it wouldn't get past the first post now, but th things were different. And so I did a PhD at King's College in, in London, and I really enjoyed it. 
And when I finished, I thought, I just, I want to keep going with this. Um, the nature of research is that you're often on fixed term contracts, which is one of the challenges. Um, and so the next study I did, which, which was at the Royal College of Nursing in their research unit, was on early discharge after surgery, which was interesting, but I, was really, I really wanted to focus on pain. Um, and so a bit later on, the Department of Health was advertising postdoctoral um, fellowships, as they were called then, and so I went for one of those, and I got it, and, and I was based in the health psychology unit of the Royal Free Hospital in London, and I did a study looking at relaxation for patients who've got chronic non-malignant pain. And I did a trial, um, had a baby, went on to the National Institute for Nursing and started running a pain management um, program of research up there, had another baby. Um, eventually the National Institute of Nursing merged with the Royal College of Nursing and over time I became head of research there at the, at the Royal College of Nursing and we had a great phase there and a lot of fun. And then we moved to the University of Warwick as part of a strategic alliance in 2007. And I've been director of research ever since. Mostly I've really loved it and it's been fun and we've had great colleagues. But there's lots of challenges. You're always going for outside funding for research. Um, staff are on fixed term contracts. I'm on a fixed term contract. So you've got all that uncertainty and you've got to keep getting the money to cover your salary. But I've learned so much. And I feel I've been able to make a real difference to care and to support um, with some fantastic researchers from nursing, but also from a range of disciplines as well. When I trained, it was really difficult to stay in clinical practice if you wanted to do research. Oxford was a leading centre for lecturer practitioner roles, but even in those, it was really hard to fit in research. Um, but things are changing now. Some of you might know about academic um, clinical academic programs, and I just wanted to give you a flavour of, of what there is. Obviously it takes time to become an independent researcher, there are a lot of skills you need to develop, but unlike in the past, there is this framework there now. So first of all, internships on, on the left in the orange, this is really an introduction to research from trial design, data management, and giving you practical research experience. And they fund it for six months and give backfill for your time. Um, and then they want you to go on and probably be a research champion in the, in the trust. When I've supervised, um, I used to be involved in the evidence-based healthcare masters at Oxford University, and they found that as well. They do this masters and then the trust would say, want them to be their research champion and their research expert. And that was always quite scary for people because they felt they were just beginning. Um, so that's the internship. For, for the Masters in Clinical Research, there's 10 higher education institutes funded to provide this, this program, um, and it's designed for people who want a career that combines clinical practice with developing into independent research. And the studentships, um, you're, you're seconded on with, the, with your full salary. You don't have to take a pay cut. Um, and they pay for course fees, um, and they can be, that, the masters can be done full-time over one year or part-time over two years, and often people do do it part-time so they can keep their clinical role. Then there's the clinical doctoral research fellowships, um, and again, this is when you want to do a PhD and still keep your clinical, your clinical role, and again, you're funded on your, on your salary and they cover your tuition fees. When you get on to what they call clinical lectureships, that's designed for early postdoctoral professionals who want to develop into independent clinical academic researchers. And at this point, they fund 50% of your salary because they're expecting the trust to fund the other 50%. And the same happens with the, with the senior lecture. Um, again, it's the next stage up, and at that point, they're expecting you to be a clinical academic leader, and they fund 50% of your salary. They expect the trust to pick up the other 50%, but that's for five years that final one so it's you know there's a very good program there there's still a an ac a academic route if you didn't want to stay in clinical practice where you do you probably become a research assistant for a while and do your master's degree then you do a phd then you do a postdoctoral and then you get a prof a senior um, research fellowship and then a professorial research fellowship so there's a parallel one in in academia but this wasn't there at all you know, when I trained, and you and you had to not, you had to more or less just stop doing any clinical. For a while, I ran around like a headless chicken doing bank in various ITUs all around London. But it, you know, at one point, I sat down. I thought, why am I doing this? Um, and, and the way I've sort of got got used to and felt easy about that, because I did feel guilty about it for ages. Um, 
is I work very closely with, with patients and clinical colleagues, so I feel I keep up to speed in that way because it's quite difficult to do everything. And, and these sort of roles where you're integrating it, they do have their challenges and you do have to be careful about boundaries, but at least they're there. You can apply for them. I was having a look at the vision of, the, of two of the trusts here. Um, the Oxford University Hospitals Trust is, in their vision, they're talking about delivering and developing excellence and value in patient care, teaching and research within a culture of compassion and integrity. So research very firmly in there. And the Oxford Health NHS Foundation Trust talking about having an international reputation for teacher, teaching, training and research, as well as translating in, innovations and putting technology into practice. So it's really encouraging to see the major trusts have got research very firmly in there. So you're li lucky, I think, to be working in a time when it's, when it's really valued and you've got access into these schemes. Brooks, of course, has got its new Institute of Nursing and Allied Health Research that Deborah Jackson leads, where the, the aim there is to lead and participate in world-class research and evidence-based practice. Um, the, the Ferndale campus, I know, is moving very soon to a new building. When, when I was first asked to, to come and talk to you, it was to tie in with the opening, but as you can see, things have got slightly out of sync. Um, but I'm pleased to come here because I feel I've got a sense of history and I've been to your Ferndale, your Ferndale campus. But when you move to your new premises, when I was looking at the documents for that, the, the, the staff here are talking about enhancing teaching, learning and research for the Swindon staff and students. So again, research is firmly in there. Couldn't finish this without um, looking at the NMC Code of Practice, obviously. One of the, one of the parts of the, of the Code of Practice is always to practice in line with the best available evidence. So you're making sure that any information or advice given is evidence-based. So that's, you know, including healthcare products and services. And that you maintain your knowledge and skills for safe and effective practice. So what about research that has really made a difference. I'd like to give you an example of some research that I think has really made a difference. Now there's tons of research I could have picked um, and, and there's lots of different examples and you'll have your own favorite ones prob probably. Um, but I wanted to illustrate it with a study um, that I was involved in. And the reason I've picked this one is it shows how you can keep building on what you've done and then how you can use different ways of telling people about your research to, to get it to have maximum impact. Um, what we did, we did a qualitative systematic review that looked at what pain was like for people with chronic pain. So what we were doing was trying to draw together all the qualitative research evidence that addresses um, chronic pain. I'm not going to go over the methods in detail. I've got the reference if you want to have a look at it. Um, but we did, a, we did this review. It involved... Um, 77 papers that met certain criteria and drawing all of those together. So we did the review, we wrote some papers, we wrote three papers and they've been cited about 50 times so far. Um, but we also made a video of the findings and put it up on YouTube and it's had 17 and a half thousand viewings. I can't believe it. It's top of the NIH TV series. So which I was very pleased about. Um, and then we evaluated the impact of the film on some healthcare professionals who watched it. And now we're doing another piece of research. So I just wanted, I'm not going to show the um, clip. I just, it's, it's, when you're speaking, it's far too nerve wracking having an embedded clip and hoping it will run because there's this awful pause and everyone's looking at you and rolling their eyes as it doesn't work. So, so that it, if, you, if you want to look at it, it's a 10 minute film. That lady's an actress. And if you type in just struggling and chronic pain, it will come up on, on YouTube. The URL is ridiculously long. It's like that. Um, and it was great fun making the film. You have to do a storyboard of key ideas. And you see them being turn, turned into a film, which is really amazing. But one of the main findings was that people with chronic non-cancer pain face this daily struggle. And it was often a really adversarial struggle. So they struggled in several different areas. They struggled to find who was the real me? Was it this person with pain or was it the person before that? They struggled to find an explanation for their suffering. What's causing this pain? Because often there was no obvious cause. They struggled to negotiate the healthcare system and to negotiate with healthcare professionals. Because often they were doing repeated tests and there was nothing showing up. They struggled then, as you won't be surprised to know, to, hear, to, to, to have their pain seen as something that was legitimate. 
A lot of them talked about not being believed. And they struggled then to find the right balance between looking like they were sick or well, or whether they were showing or hiding their pain. So there was this real theme of struggling and, and, and adversarial. Some were able to move, move forward alongside their pain, but a lot weren't. Now, one of the interesting things about um, this, this YouTube video is that people have left comments. Now, obviously, these aren't systematically collected, but I just thought I'd show you. One said, I can truly relate to this. Thank you for this honest and upfront portrayal of living with chronic pain on an everyday basis. Another one said, oh my God, yes, this video speaks so much about what I've been through in the last eight years. This is spot on. Thanks for giving us a voice. And someone said, this video should be sent to every health professional. So some of the comments were really, really heartbreaking, actually, but a lot of them felt that no one had understood and this had given them a voice. And so it's been disseminated quite widely and a lot of chronic pain support groups have got this video on their, on their um, website. And then the, the last bullet point, we evaluated the impact of the film on some healthcare professionals who'd, who'd watched it. Um, and they really felt that it had helped them learn. And the sort of things that came out of this were they talked about a glimpse beneath the surface and actually being able to see the person behind the pain. Yeah, shall we ask them to come in? <laughs> um, they talked about the pitfalls of the medical model um, and recognising the challenges both for patients and clinicians of sitting with people rather than trying to fix stuff when it wasn't fixable, just being alongside them. They talked about health professionals feeling bombarded by despair because there wasn't much they could do and that that was really hard. And they talked about having to reconstruct the clinical clinical journey as a shared journey where they were w working together with patients rather than fixing things. And so I think this illustrates quite well how a film can, you know, we'd all like to think that when we write something, lots of people read it. Reality is not that many do, but when you, when you can disseminate it using different formats, it can reach a completely different audience. And I think what we found when we looked at the impact of the film is that that sort of emotional engagement that you get from watching a film and seeing someone and what it's like gives you a different sort of learning to reading a paper. And whilst I always think my papers are all completely thrilling, obviously that, you know, it's, it's not just not the same sort of thing and it's a different experience. And then the on the basis of all of this, we've been funded to do another qualitative systematic review where we're looking at the experiences of healthcare professionals looking after people with chronic pain because what we found um, in doing all of this is that it's actually really quite hard to be alongside someone when you can't make any difference to their pain. So I just, you know, thought that, that it would be useful to, to show how it, how it can sort of stack up and progress. Um, things don't always go smoothly with, funded, with funding. We've also put in two bids to try and evaluate the impact of the film more formally. These were not funded. It's another skill you need. It takes three months to write some of these grants, um, and your chances of getting stuff funded it depends where you go, but it's sort of roughly one in five. So you've got to get quite resilient in, get, in getting over disappointments, um, which is quite a good life skill anyway, I suppose. But I'm pretty good at getting over disappointments. And just to give you a flavour of the sorts of things we do where I work, um, just very briefly, we've got four main themes of, of research that really make a difference and it's, are the reasons why we bother. Um, we've got a, a theme of research around experiences of care and this is around patients' experiences but also carers and healthcare professionals' experiences of care. We've got a theme around patient and public involvement in research. Patient reported outcomes, so what's, what matters to them rather than what matters to researchers or, or only clinicians. And then translating knowledge into practice. So when we've got all this evidence, how do we actually get it used in everyday practice? So it's great, it's great fun, but it's not a bed of roses. Getting funding, funding can be really hard. Dealing with fixed term contracts is challenging. Um, getting data can be an uphill struggle. Um, but when the PhD students I was talking to, um, when, when they, they said when they talk to people at work about why they're doing a PhD and what they're doing, so people at work are really proud of it and they're really inspired by their colleagues doing, doing a PhD. Um, some of them are less enamoured. Um, they said that quite often they get asked, isn't it just boring, aren't you just sitting at a desk all day? 
But what I'm hoping that I can show you today is that actually, if you get an area that you're interested in where you've got a really pressing question, boring is absolutely the last word I'd use. It's so interesting and you can make such a difference. So whatever else it might be, for me, it's definitely not boring. So in the future, you really do have a fantastic opportunity both to use and do research, and it increases our understanding of care and improves that nursing care. If you're just starting out, some of you might not know, I mean, you probably know about the databases like Medline and Sinal and the Cochrane collaboration, but NIHR have... Um, very thick reports on research, which if you're working out, you know, what sort of methods should I use, there's very detailed reports on methods in some of these um, journals. So if, if you're interested in that, it's a really good source for looking at to see how other people have designed research and how do these methods work in detail. Because obviously when you've got papers, you, office, you often don't have um, very, many, very many details. So when you're making decisions, you have to use evidence about care and research evidence is important. Obviously, you've got to mix this with your clinical experience and patient experiences and preferences and local information. And the Promoting Action on Research Implementation and Health Services framework, which I've been involved in, um, argues that if you want to get evidence into practice, doing that is a function of the nature of the ev research evidence, how robust it is, how accepted it is, what the context is like that you're trying to get that research into and how much help people have. So it's not only about research, it's also about your own clinical experience, patient experience, preferences, local information, and blending those together when you make clinical decisions. The NHS, in its five-year forward view, um, a couple of years ago now, described research as vital in providing the evidence we need to transform services and improve outcomes. So research, as you saw at the beginning, is something your dean supports. It's supported by the trusts. I love that picture of all the different, um, different uniforms. I, I noticed at the RCN the other day when I was in headquarters, they got a, an exhibition with all the old hats, all the different hats that you used to have. You can, you can take a picture with these hats on, which I, I decline that opportunity. I thought be, the evidence would be a bit too embarrassing. Um, so Oxford Brooks has been educating nursing for 125 years. The RCN has been around for 100 years, both really important anniversaries. It's always a good time to look back and look forward. Nursing has changed, doing research has changed. Using research is much more mainstream now. In fact, it's part of the NMC code and the NHS sees it as vital. So I'd like to close by saying, yes, you should bother. It's more than that. It's about making your care the best that it possibly can be. Whether you're a user of research or a doer of research, it's a crucial part of nursing. In the past, I think it was a bit of an optional extra. If you did it, you were a bit strange, perhaps. You didn't quite fit in. But things have really changed now. Research is central to providing the best possible care. And that is something we all want to do. Thank you.